Hi everyone, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I see all the, the, the numbers of all of you out there, so it's really exciting and I hope that we, uh, you really are able to give you the information that you need and also, um, you know, if you have questions, to put them into the chat box um, and we'll hopefully be able to get to them. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, a little bit on. But uh, I'm Mark Bogosian and I'm the Director of uh, the Quality of Life Grants Program here at the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. And I'd like to welcome you to this uh, technical assistance webinar for uh, applying for this second cycle of 2019 in which we're offering both direct effect and high impact priority grants. Um, you know, just one thing uh, off the start is all grants must be completed within 12 months after receipt of the award funds and they are non-renewable. And uh, we're planning for projects that are awarded through this cycle to start on January 1st, 2020, and they will close on December 31st, 2020. Um, exact dates would, you know, that's, the, that's what we're hoping to based on our review process, but I will also talk about that. But for right now, we are looking at a January 1st start date with a December 31st, 2020 close date. Um, the foundation is no longer able to provide individual pre-award assistance, you know, either by uh, email or by telephone. However, um, we welcome you to submit questions about this application process to qol at christopherreeve.org, and that email address is going to be visible in an upcoming slide. But all questions that are submitted through email um, will be collected, aggregated, and answered in a question and answers document that will be posted on our website, um, as well as these slides. These will also be posted on our website. And as I mentioned earlier, you can also submit questions in the chat box. And the deadline for any emailed questions is this coming Friday, um, end of business, Friday, September 20th. All right, so let me just give a quick overview of what we're going to be doing today. I'm going to give a quick interview, uh, introduction to the Reef Foundation, to the National Paralysis Resource Center, and the Quality of Life Grants programs. We'll then move into some funding restrictions, eligibility, and allowable expenses. And then I'll talk about the two grant programs that we're offering, giving both a description of the program and you know, different types of projects that are funded. Uh, we'll then look at accessing the online grants portal as all grants that are submitted are submitted through the online grants portal. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the application process and then what happens after that with either award notification and grantee requirements if awarded. Um, the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation is paralysis focused and as such, our, our grant funding must be targeted to projects that will serve individuals living with paralysis, their families, and caregivers. And we use a functional definition of paralysis, which is difficulty or inability to use arms and or legs due to a neurological condition, which you know, is, includes but is not limited to what we have here listed, such as spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, stroke, cerebral palsy, spina bifida, ALS, uh, post-polio syndrome, and others. Um, the Quality of Life Grants Program is part of the Reeve Foundation's National Paralysis Resource Center. And um, the National Paralysis Resource Center, which I'll, I'll be calling uh, the National PRC going forward, has been fund, uh, federally funded uh, since 2014 to a cooperative agreement with ACL, and that is the Administration for uh, Community Living. Um, the National PRC provides deeply needed information, programs, and individualized support and assistance to over 5.3 million Americans living with paralysis. And I'd like to take just a few moments to highlight the National PRC so that you're aware of all the services we offer. And, you know, we offer these services to you and to your stakeholders. So I really hope that you 
really take advantage of all that we do have to offer. Um, the foundation of the National PRC is our uh, informa information specialists, and they have provided one-on-one -on -one assistance to over 100,000 families in 170 languages through either phone calls or emails, um, you know, follow-up. Uh, the people that are served range from those living with paralysis, those newly injured or diagnosed, those that have been living with paralysis for 20 plus years, uh, family members, friends who have questions. It's open to anyone that needs any kind of information. Um, we are here to respond and help and, and guide you to the right answer. Um, we also have a military and veterans program which supports the unique needs of our servicemen and women. We have a peer and family support program with over 385 certified peer mentors, and they have provided support to over 11,000 people um, to date. Uh, we have a virtual community of over 3 million users uh, who visit our website and Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and other social media outlets. There's also Reeve Connect, which is a private forum for our community, which you know is those that are living with paralysis, their families, friends, caregivers, and paralysis and disabilities related organizations. And Really, I invite all of you to sign up and add your voice and to share your expertise with us and with uh, all of those that are a part of this forum. So you know, to do so, please just go to our website, which is www.christopherreeve.org. Um, you'll also see the Quality of Life grants here. And uh, so we are a part of the National Paralysis Resource Center. And um, that means, yes, we're funded through the cooperative agreement with ACL. And um, I just want to add that we have recently just funded over $26 million to over 300,000 programs since uh, the beginning of our grants programs, which is really, really exciting. Um, and lastly, I just want to tell you that the National PRC provides free health-related resources and materials and um, all of these resources are free, which includes our flagship publication, the Paralysis Resource Guide, wallet cards, which deal with issues uh, such as sepsis or deep vein thrombosis. We have brochures on bladder and bowel management or you know, pressure in injuries and skin management, and a number of fact sheets. Everything is available on our website, which can be downloaded and or we can send them to you. So we really invite you to reach out to us for any of these materials, both for your organizational use or for those, uh, you know, those that you serve. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Quality of Life Grants Program uh, has, since its inception, awarded over $26 million to over 3,000 projects, and it was created by the late Dana Reeve. Um, and I, I did mention earlier also that you know, we are uh, funded through our cooperative agreement with ACL. Before beginning your application, we recommend that you read the application and program guidelines, which provides information about the QOL grants program, program and funding, tier descriptions, uh, eligibility criteria, funding restrictions, and allowable expenses. And you know, we're going to talk about those things today, but they go much more in depth. So. Um, these guidelines are available on our website, and we also ask you to visit our website for, you know, just to look at the overview of the QOL grants program and the QOL grant application process. Um, and we ask that you please read all of the information contained in these documents and on the web pages just to familiarize yourself with the application process and to better prepare the required information that's requested in the applications. Um, I do want to point out too that also available on our website is uh, 
something called the, the People First Language Guide, and that's really guidelines for discussing people with disabilities. And it's something that our external reviewers look at, uh, you know, quite deeply in, in ways that, you know, making sure that people that are living with paralysis that are, that are you know, that are funds are being asked for are really being served in a way where they're understood. And it's a way to talk about um, all people of all different abilities. So please take a look at that. And there's also a quick guide to uh, establishing evaluation indicators. And the grant application process uh, requires you to describe um, indicators, both you know, evaluation indicator indicators, which you're going to use to measure the success of the project. And the indicators must be a combination of both input and output indicators and must be measurable. Um, you're also going to be asked in the application to describe the evaluation methods that you use, you know, whether it be surveys or interviews or focus groups or you know, a review of the program documents. So please you know, make sure that you do go and take a look at that quick guide to establishing um, evaluation indicators. So in accordance with our federal cooperative agreement with ACL, the Reed Foundation is prohibited from funding the following. And I'm going to read this just because, you know, and I hate when people read slides, but um, I, I feel like this is an important slide to, to, read, to read through these funding restrictions. So um, we are unable to fund grants that award, are awarded directly to individuals. Uh, we're also not able to fund for-profit companies. So we can fund only nonprofit organizations, municipalities, and tribal entities. Um, and if you have any questions about, you know, our, you know, if you're a parks department, yes, you are part of a municipality, um, uh, you know, a church, universities, uh, any kind of education, uh, schools, uh, school districts, yes. Those are also included. Um, we're not able to fund organizations and projects that are based outside of the United States or projects that utilize contractors or vendors that are outside of the United States. So if you know, any of your materials or you know, supplies are coming from Canada or another country, um, we are not able to pay for those supplies. Uh, we also are restricted from funding research. Uh, we are also restricted from funding rehabilitative therapy. Um, however, as, as these next few bullets say, we are able to fund programs that assist people living with paralysis to participate in exercise opportunities. So think of it this way, programs that use a physical or operational therapist to work directly with the person with paralysis, that's considered part of rehabilitative therapy. However, if the exercise opportunity is facilitated by someone who has a bachelor's degree in exercise science or is a certified fitness instructor, that would be an allowable expense. Um, also, under our cooperative agreement, we are unable to fund equipment, but I really want to clarify this, and you, you, there's usually a lot of questions about this, but we can fund equipment if it's part of a loan closet. Otherwise, equipment that is provided to individuals is considered a gift. Um, equipment can also be funded if it provides access and or promotes independence. And I'm going to give you a few examples of what this means. So providing access, um, you know, in the examples here, adaptive strollers that are used as part of a program and are not given out to individuals and remain on site, that would be the same thing if it were a, a wheelchair basketball team. The, the wheelchairs are, you know, we're able to fund those, but they must stay on site that are used for everyone and you know, don't go home with the individual. Um, another example would be a transfer chair at a community pool or an examination table in a rural area or in a place where there's no such equipment available in that region. Uh, you, know, you could be the only place for over 100 miles, 200 miles that has this type of um, 
equipment that is needed, which you're therefore providing access. Promoting independence, in, in a lot of ways it's very similar, but you know, an example that we'd like to give is a scale, because knowing your weight promotes independence. It allows you to remain healthy. Um, as you know, being overweight can lead to a whole host of chronic health conditions. So that is something that we would consider promoting independence. Um, beach wheelchairs and adaptive bikes at a community park or you know, sports wheelchairs at a community sports team, um, those also promote independence and even though you know, they could also very well fall under providing access. Um, equipment can also be purchased under our Nursing Home Transition Grant Program which is part of the high impact priority tiers and I'll go specifically into that and talk about what is allowable under that program. Um, again, in keeping with our uh, you know, funding restrictions, um, the development of prototypes for inventions or equipment or other research and developmental activities that involve intellectual property rights are not allowable. And here's another one that, that sometimes is a little fuzzy, so, um, you know, if you have questions, please reach out to us and ask. Um, we are not able to fund construction of buildings or major construction. However, we can fund simple accessibility modifications, such as, you know, to an existing structure. And it must be an existing structure where we're doing the modification. Um, we can do um, playgrounds, uh, trails, um, you know, within a, a building, let's say you're looking to modify a bathroom, we, you know, it would be simple bathroom modifications, you know, putting in grab bars, making the bathroom that already exists accessible. It wouldn't be building on a new bathroom to the building. So um, it's a very, you know, at times could be a fuzzy line, but if you have any questions, please do reach out to us because we want to make sure that you're not spinning your wheels and we certainly don't want to waste your time. So we're more than happy to answer those types of technical questions. Um, we also are not able to fund projects that serve less than three individuals living with paralysis. Um, I mentioned earlier that you know the majority of people that are supported through these grants, the majority must be living with paralysis. Um, and here, you know, we're saying the, the, the very least has to be three individuals. Um, we're also not able to fund uh, fundraising events or paid fundraiser positions, any kind of lobbying or efforts to influence legislation. And we can also not um, fund projects that cannot be completed within that 12-month time period. Um, everything has to be wrapped up and completed by the end of that 12 month and we're also asking you know, for some kind of performance measures on those. Um, so you know, if it's a 15 month project, this unfortunately is not the, the, you know, the grant program that would be able to do that. Um, and we also can't fund projects that have already been completed. So if you know, the grant starts you know, this coming January and the project is done by November of this year, we're not able to support that. Um, food of any kind is also not allowable through our uh, cooperative agreement with ACL. And that means, you know, meals, lunch, beverages, alcohol, even water. So if you're a camp and you're, you know, holding, a, you know, a summer camp, um, we, you know, we can provide a myriad of things for that, but we cannot provide food. Um, we also are not able to provide medical services. And all of these are listed in the application as well as in the, um, the guidelines. Um, quality of life grant applications are accepted, as I mentioned earlier, nonprofit organizations, um, municipalities, and tribal entities. And we've changed our um, eligibility requirements. So this is the very first time um, that 
if you've received a, a, a quality of life grant in any category, you may reapply one year after notification of grant closure from us, which means you've received an email after you've submitted your final report that says, um, we, you know, thank you, your grant is now closed. And uh, of course, if it's a grant that closed out in 2016 or 2017, that's been closed and we have the final report on file, you're always eligible. Um, so the 2019 cycle here for both the direct effect and the high impact priority grants start on, as I said earlier, January 1st, 2020. So therefore, prior grantees who have received notification of grant closure, closure for their past award by January 2019 are eligible. Um, if you have any questions about this, please email us at you know, qol at christopherreeve.org. And again, I'm going to put that up on the, um, that'll, that'll show up in one of the slides here. Um, also, funding for um, continuation projects uh, that have already been funded through either the direct effect or the um, high impact priority tiers will not be considered. Um, and, and I also just want to jump back a second again to just say that, so if you have a current or open grant under any grant program or tier, then you're not eligible to receive funding through this grant cycle. Um, multiple submissions um, from one organization are not, will not be considered. However, organizations uh, that are that are you know, more than one chapter of a national organization, you may apply for uh, you know, grants within the same grant cycle. And special consideration uh, will be given to proposed uh, projects that serve current military and or veterans and their families, as well as those projects that target individuals with paralysis in underserved groups of the population, which um, include, you know, what's listed here, and I will go through them, you know, but not limited to, you know, persons at risk of incarceration, current or released prisoners, ethnic minorities, uh, homeless, uh, people living with homelessness, uh, indigenous or tribal communities, the LGBTQ populations, um, limited English proficiency, uh, the rural residents, migrant workers, low income and or poverty populations, um, and also newly injured people living with paralysis and their caregivers. So those are areas that are given special consideration, um, you know, as they are really underserved groups of the population. So the quality of life grants programs can both really support a range of programmatic expenses for a wide range of programs and services. And I'm going to cover those um, under each area for both direct effect and high impact uh, priority descriptions. And I'll talk to you about the types of projects funded. Um, and that will be in the upcoming slides. But I just, you know, want you to, to be able to see that, yes, we, um, we can support programmatic personnel, consultants, contracted workers, entry fees, transportation costs, facility rentals, travel reimbursement, marketing, equipment. Uh, again, uh, I do put it here because I want you to know that, yes, you can, but just keep in mind those restrictions on equipment. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about the travel. So the same guidelines that we have to adhere to within our federal cooperative agreement, we are passing on to you. So that means airfare is you know, capped at $500 a round trip, train at $275, hotel at $225 per night, and mileage at uh, it's $0.58 cents per mile. Um, and just, you know, something else to really keep in mind is that programmatic expenses directly related to serving individuals with paralysis and their families are considered more favorable than operational expenses and or, you know, large capital projects. So, uh, you know, we, 
we'll talk about the nursing home transition uh, program in a little bit, but just while we're talking about allowable expenses, um, I do want you to know that award funds for the nursing home transition uh, program can be used to address barriers to facilitating successful nursing home transitions for individuals living with paralysis. And this can include startup costs, you know, such as housing de uh, deposits or equipment like medical devices or uh, Hoyer lifts or assistive technology or adaptive equipment, supplies, uh, startup supplies, general home furnishings, and in the past have included such things as stoves or dishwashers, something in which somebody who is living with paralysis can access where they could not access their stove before because, you know, the knobs were on the top. Um, you know, this would be a stove where uh, access is provided to somebody who is in a chair, et cetera, where they can access it in the front. So various things like that are allowable through the um, nursing home transition. Um, and, you know, indirect costs, uh, fees for filing legal documents, all of those types of things um, are allowable under nursing home transition, as would be the expansion of a, of a position. So you have a part-time role that is being converted into a full-time role to complete, you know, more assessments or more uh, more visits. So this would be, um, you know, something to think about if you are looking at the nursing home transition program. But again, I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, for now, uh, the direct effect is uh, our tier one, and those are open focused. And we're looking, you know, based on what our budget is, to award at least 26 grants of up to $25,000. Um, you know, not all the grants uh, requests come in at $25,000. Sometimes they're they're less, um, but that is the cap. And those fund, you know, specific by budget items that will clearly impact individuals living with paralysis, their families, and their caregivers, and they must be completed in 12 months. And you know these these projects, the direct effect, have really short to medium range impact. Um, we're not looking for long term impact and sustainability through these grants. And um, in the next slide, I'm going to you know go into the examples of funded projects. Um, but I just also quickly want to outline what the high impact priority grants are, and those focus on. Um, high priority issues for people that are living with uh, paralysis. And we have three tiers, which would be uh, a tier two, which would be for transportation, respite caregiving, and disaster response. Um, and those are grants of up to $30,000. Tier three is the nursing home transition grants. Those are up to $40,000. And tier four are employment grants, and those are up to $50,000. And again, in the next few slides, I'm going to really go into more depth on what each of these are. So the Direct Effect Quality of Life grants fund a wide range of projects, and here are some examples, you know, accessibility modifications, adaptive sports, uh, advocacy, arts, camp, um, fitness and wellness, um, media development, service animal programs, and um, we do, you know, a number of, you know, therapeutic horseback riding. So really everything listed here, there's a number, it varies. You, you know, bring us your best ideas that are going to really make, um, you know, a difference in the quality of people's lives. Um, the next slide we're going to look at talks about, you know, different types of program, you know, projects that we funded in the past, and again, it could be sports wheelchairs for, or a wheelchair basketball team, or a hydraulic lift at a pool, um, electric door openers at a community center, um, accessible picnic tables at a, at a county fairground or park. Um, transportation costs, uh, subsidized lessons for therapeutic riding, support groups, 
Um, I also urge you to you know, go to our website and take a look at um, the full listing of grants made through each tier. Um, they're all there from, uh, I believe, 19, uh, 20, 20, uh, 15 onward. So it, it really gives a great overview of everything that has been funded. Our Tier 2 High Impact Priority uh, grants are, again, transportation, respite, caregiving, and disaster response. Uh, transportation grant funds support organizations and programs that provide accessible transportation to people living with paralysis to access services within their communities. But in addition, you could also have a project that we would fund that supports adaptive driving education programs to enable people living with paralysis to learn how to drive or to increase their independence and transportation options. We have the respite caregiving program, and this area recognizes family caregivers and the vital role that they play in caring for those with paralysis. Um, the fund support nonprofits that offer exemplary and innovative respite care services that are evidence-based, appear promising, or are trying new service models. Um, and as noted in the grant application and program guidelines, the forms of respite that are supported through this grant are emergency respite, home-based services, sitter companion services, consumer-directed respite, out-of-home respite, family care homes or host family, uh, respite center-based adult day health care centers, and parent family cooperatives. However, grant funds cannot be used to support respite in the following environments, such as corporate foster home settings for children and teens, residential facilities, um, respitality model, hospital-based, hospice, or camps. The Tier 3 Nursing Home Transition, which I've talked about a little bit, funds um, the support, the, the funds support either centers for independent living or other organizations that provide transition services across the country to transition people that are living with paralysis in the nursing home back into their homes or into a community-based setting of their choice. However, funds can also be used to um, keep people from entering nursing homes. So it, it's to both to transition people out of nursing homes, but also to keep people from entering nursing homes where they can therefore keep their independence. Um, and Tier 4 is employment. And those grant funds support programs that provide uh, both job education, job development services, um, adaptive technology, job coaching, you know, anything with the goal of finding gainful employment. Um, and those grants are up to $50,000. You know, so people often ask, you know, what is a successful grant or a successful application? And, you know, we have a, you know, a very rigorous review process here, which I will talk about later, um, you know, where everything is first vetted through an external review committee, um, is scored and weighed, and then is passed on to an internal review committee um, where it, it, you know, it goes through a number of various meetings. So um, what makes a successful grant is a project or a program that directly impacts people living with paralysis. And again, that does include their families and caregivers. And that impact can be demonstrated through you know, the numbers of people served or you know, other quantitative measures that you'll be using and developing through these grant programs, um, you know, as well as stories um, and examples of people's lives just being improved by the services that you are or you know, services, programs, or projects that you're offering. 
Um, and I just do want to add that um, you know, nonprofit organizations with programs that promote expansion or innovation or best practices or promising practices and or evidence-based practices are strongly encouraged to apply. So as I mentioned earlier, the um, quality of life grant applications are completed online through the website that's listed uh, there, and that is that goes to the Reeve Foundation Online Grants Portal. Um, it's also accessible through our website and in the grant application and program guidelines. There are links that will take you directly there. Um, you know, you could also copy down that www.grant interface and um, you know, put that into your web browser. Um, here we ask too that you please add QOL at ChristopherReed.org and administrator at grantinterface.com to your acceptable email address list. Um, and that's to avoid having any email communication from us blocked by spam blocker software. And we do contact uh, you, know, you if there's a, a question about your proposal or an issue, you know, something's missing in the budget, et cetera. So, you know, please do make sure that you have those um, on your safe list so that we can get in touch with you. So after you click on the link to access the Foundation Grant Portal, you're going to be brought straight to our logon page. And if this is the first time that you're applying for a grant, you're going to need to create a new account. So you're going to click on the Create New Account button, and you're going to be asked to input contact information and information about your organization. And if you need any assistance, there's a link to a registration tutorial video on this page. Um, and you can always please email us, qol at christopherreed.org. Um, if you've applied in the past, and you know, just enter your email address and the password that you had previously created. If you've forgotten your password, click on the Forgot Your Password link, and an email will be sent to you with your password. And if you don't remember or have access to the email account that's related to the organization, please contact us at QOL Christopher, at ChristopherReed.org for assistance. It's really important that you enter an email address and password that is already connected with the organization's account. Um, and we ask that you please do not create a duplicate organizational profile as the organizational application history is connected to all of your grant profile. So it, it lists grants you've applied for in the past, grants you've received, and it has the, the whole um, list of information, which is really important um, when uh, asked in certain applications to submit a um, final report from your last report. Um, it, that allows us to also verify. And sometimes if the organization has a number of organizations listed, you know, it could be the Foundation or Foundation Inc. or you know, different variations, we're then unable to find your past history. So please, if you're not sure, again, contact us. And we also just ask that you please review your organization and contact profiles that are in the online system and to just update them with the most current um, information. Sometimes there are organizations that, um, you know, that, that have applied you know, in 2016 and they have a new executive director or a new program officer. So please make sure to update that and take off the, the people that are no longer a part of your organization so that when we do reach out to them, um, we'll be reaching out to the, the correct person. Um, so once you've applied, um, you're going to be, you know, once you've uh, created the new ac ac account or have logged on to the portal, you're going to be brought to this uh, apply page. And what you're going to do is click on the apply button uh, for whichever type of grant you're applying, and that's that 
blue button over on the right hand side. And um, it does say it here, but please note that the um, application submission deadline is Tuesday, October 22nd, and that's at 11.59 p.m. And the, you know, the software is created in such a way, you know, not by us, but by our software developer, our, our vendor. Um, it, 11.59, it closes off, and you're no longer able to submit anything after that time. So please be sure to get that in well in advance of 11.59. Um, we've had people trying to submit at 11.58 and they've run into a little issue or so and it hasn't accepted it if you know, it goes past 11.59. So you know, please do try to get it in um, earlier. Now once you do a click on the Apply button, you're going to be, uh, for you know, whichever specific grant program that you're applying for, you'll be brought directly to the application. Um, and you can print out the application questions, even though they are listed in the, um, you know, in the, uh, uh, all, all of the, the earlier information, the application and program guidelines. But if you click on, click on the question list button that's in the upper right hand corner, um, a Word document will be downloaded. And these application questions, um, you know, it helps to have it written out. It lists um, paragraph counts uh, for text limits, and a lot of applicants do find it helpful to, to create a draft application first in Word, which then can be used to cut and paste your answers into the text fields in the online application. Um, the application uh, is broken down, as you'll see here, into the following sections, which is the eligibility, there's an eligibility quiz there, um, a proposal summary, organizational information, proposal description, budget information, and supporting documents. And we, uh, you know, we ask that you please respond to all of the questions and noting that the fields that have an asterisk next to them, they are required questions. Um, you can save your application at any time. If you look down at the bottom, you see uh, the two buttons that are next to each other, Save Application. You hit that and you can come back to it at any time. Um, and when you've completed your application, you hit the Submit Application, which is the blue button on the bottom right hand of the form. So this is just kind of an idea of you know, what the application is going to look like, what the questions look like. Um, and it, um, you'll see that there are character limits listed under each block. Um, 3,000 characters is about one page of a Word document. So where you see um, questions that have 10,000 um, character uh, limit, that's about three pages of a Word document. And we do not require that you use all of the allotted characters, but just know that the system won't allow you to go over that limit. So in this case where some of them are 3,000, you know, that's about one page of a, a Word document. We've also revised the uh, project budget line template for those of you that haven't uh, applied to us in the, perhaps the past year. And what we ask you to do is type in the budget line item, also type in the cost of the line item and the requested amount. So the subtotal and total costs, they will formulate automatically. And just please note that the following areas make up this budget. So we have personnel costs, we have equipment, we have consultants, contractors, there's supplies, travel, other costs, and uh, the next page shows that we also um, ask for um, other sources of funding and note if the funding is committed or pending. And as I said earlier, all of the subtotal costs for each budget area will re you know, formulate into this bottom section here of the template. So the total funds in this piece here will mirror those that are listed above in the line item budget. So you don't need to add anything into those. Those will be populated by what you've put into the previous budget lines. 
we have also are including a budget narrative requirement. And the budget narrative must include a description and justification of each budget category and line item that is presented in your proposed budget. And all expenses should clearly relate to the project narrative. So in, in, you know, one way to think about it is that the budget narrative should really help us get a better understanding of what the grant funds are being used for. So once you do respond to all of the questions and upload the required, required documents such as the, you know, the budget template and the budget narrative, um, you simply hit that Submit Application button um, and a Submission Confirmation page will appear. Uh, the system will also send you an email indicating that your application has been received. So again, please be sure that your email address has been entered correctly. Um, and also just note that um, these system emails are the ones I referenced earlier. Those are the ones coming from administrator at grantinterface.com. And some dates to keep in mind. We, you know, we opened the cycle last week. Um, the questions, uh, so, you know, the deadline submission for the technical assistance questions is this Friday. Uh, application submission deadline is October 22nd, again at 11.59 uh, p.m. Um, we are planning to notify all applicants uh, by mid-December, mid to late December. Um, and projects will start on January 1st and close on December 31st. All applicants will be notified by email. So it, whether you are receiving an, app, uh, an award or not, you will be notified by email. But what I want to say too is, you know, we receive a number of uh, of applications, uh, sometimes it, you know, 400 plus, and due to the, you know, the the cycle and the, you know, the funds that we have available, you know, that could be anywhere from, you know, 30 grants all at, at you know, 25,000 to 70 grants, um, you know, at varying, you know. 25,000, 15,000, or 10,000, you know, varying uh, award amounts. So, you know, please know that it, it is a very competitive grant cycle, but we do not want you to not return to us. You know, please, you know, if you're not funded, please come back. Every cycle is different um, and has, you know, various, you know, Weights, meaning you know, it's uh, different applications are coming in, and it's weighed against different applications. So you know, please consider, even if you do not receive funding, um, you know, many organizations may have not received funding their first time or even second time out, but then we are able to award them. So again, you know, we really want to make sure that we are serving, you know, our our population and making sure that organizations that really merit uh, funding do receive it. So please continue to, to come back to us if not. Um, upon notice of award, you know, we're, we ask that you in, uh, indicate intent to accept the grant and that will be through an email. We will then have a grant award agreement which must be signed and countersigned, and then grant checks will be issued upon the receipt of the signed grant award agreement. And all of that would be explained going forward. Um, we also provide you with a press release template which will help you publicize the grant award. And just, you know, we regularly feature our grantees on either social media or on our website and newsletters and other publications, you know, such as our annual report. Um, so we also oftentimes will call on you guys to provide stories and photographs that we can share with our community. Um, there are two reports that are mandatory requirements, um, and they must be met to be in compliance with the Quality of Life Grants uh, program. Um, one is a six-month interim report, 
um, which really lets us know how, how you're doing, you know, is the project proceeding as planned? And if, if it's not, you know, what can we do to help you get it back on track? So it's certainly not a way to penalize anyone. It's just a way for us to know, you know, where you are. And if you, you know, need some of our help or we can offer a hand, let's, you know, work together to make sure that the, uh, you know, that the project really is successful. Um, we also have a final report that's going to be due one month after the close of the grant period. Um, and that really details the, the project's progress, the challenges, how challenges are addressed, um, the impact, and we'll also really ask for a full expenditure of um, the grant expenditures. Um, we often do site visits, which is a really great way for us to learn about your program. Um, and it's, it's such an enjoyable part of what we do. Um, you know, we'll also do site visits if, you know, at the time of your interim report you, you know, tell us you're having some issues or problems and we're more than happy to go out there and, and work with you to, you know, again, to get the project back on track because more than anything, that's what we want. We want a successful grant from you and we'll do whatever we can to really make sure that you are successful. Um, we also then have evaluation as part of the final report, um, which is conducted by Vanderbilt University, and that really gives you the opportunity to offer very candid feedback about the overall grant experience. So we ask that everybody please be as candid as possible because that's how we learn how to make this grants program better. Um, and I know that I mentioned this in the beginning, um, but in adherence with our federal cooperative agreement, we are unable to comment on denied applications or to provide programmatic direction to organizations that are applying for grants. Um, and the reason being is that it would be perceived that giving feedback or direction would be providing unfair advantage to, you know, to your organization over other applicants. So um, unfortunately, we are not able to provide any type of programmatic direction. But as I said earlier, any questions, you know, if you have a question about, you know, uh, is, is this expense acceptable or what constitutes, you know, this or that, you know, we are more than happy to, um, you know, to answer any questions like that and, you know, we'll certainly do so. And those, you know, if, you know, we are looking for questions to be received and compiled, you know, by the end of this week and we'll compile those and get those up there. And that, you know, gives everybody the opportunity to um, see and hear the response of the questions. However, if something comes up, you know, after that time, please feel free to send us an email. It just will not be gathered and aggregated and, you know, added to that document. And we, lastly, I just really do want to say thank you. Um, we really look forward to your submissions. We look forward to your questions. And I see a number of questions here. Um, and I see that we really only have about six minutes. Um, I'll, you know, I'm going to try to skim through some, see if we can get to any. Um, but if not, please know that we will be uh, taking every question that's written here, and we will be adding um, those to a document and responding to them. Um, so the, the first question that I see, which is actually a very easy one, uh, will we be getting a copy of this presentation? Um, both the uh, webinar will be archived up on our website, and that should be available very shortly, and the slides will also be there. Um, so you can access those, and uh, again, the questions too will, will be up on our website. Everything will be there. Um, let me see. There's um, so. How
how does one budget for anticipated cost increases for equipment that our vendor has indicated will take place by 2020? Um, in your vendor quote, please make sure that it is listed in, you know, on the vendor quote. Quote, um, you know, we do have a section of the web of the application in which we do ask you to upload vendor quotes um, and, uh, you know, uh, the quote and or a note from the, the vendor would certainly address that. And, um, you know, th therefore you should know what the anticipated costs would be in, in it, you know, that any, anything can be noted and shared with us through that and uploaded as well. Um, God, there are just so many. Um, uh, yes, okay, so <laughs> some of them take a while to read. Um, if applying for an accessibility project, if items such as electronic door openers are being installed by the same company that we purchased them from, should we enter the install cost separately from the purchase, so example, the contractors from the purchase cost, which would be the equipment? Um, yes, please, if possible, because that would give us, you know, an idea of what the, you know, equipment costs are versus what the, um, you know, installation costs would be. So that would be very helpful to see. And again, those two, um, you know, can be uploaded through the, um, the vendor uh, quote section and broken out within the budget line items. That would be very, very helpful. Um, So here's a, a really interesting question. What if a municipal, municipality has a long-standing policy of not quantifying its employees who are paralyzed slash use a wheelchair? This will keep the municipality from giving an actual number of those affected. Will it hurt the application? Um, no. What I would say, though, is that it's really helpful for the external reviewers and the internal reviewers to understand the number of those that, you know, potentially will be impacted. So, you know, we, we certainly can understand that there are some policies where you're not able to certainly qualify the specific number, but if you're able to provide us with numbers and, you know, some type of information, whether it's, uh, you know, through the Census Bureau or other, other forms that can, you know, share those numbers or back up those numbers, that does help. You know, again, these grants are really looking at uh, aiding and supporting the, the largest number possible. That's not, you know, the, you know, what is given precedence, but it, it certainly is something that is, is looked at. But it will not hurt the application if you're not able to give that very specific number for those reasons, and you do note that. Um, we may only have time for one more question. Um, an easy one here is if you have more entries into the budget than there are lines for information, can we add extra lines or an attachment? Yes, please. It's, a, it's an Excel spreadsheet, so you can add as many lines in there as needed. So please, yes, do so. Um, Someone has asked if we can schedule calls with us after the webinar, and unfortunately, as I, as I said, we're unable to really give any type of programmatic, um, you know, uh, guidance. Um, you know, please send everything to the QOL at ChristopherReeve.org address, and we're more than happy to respond to your question and post it on our website. Um, and oftentimes, we're also able to, you know, get back to you if you send us an email uh, directly. We are able to get back to you and also put that on the, um, you know, on the list. Um, 
again, we've just hit the 4 o'clock um, period, and I want to thank all of you. And I know that there's a million questions here that I would love to be able to get through, um, but I also really want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, and we will get to all of the questions in the budget, and I want to thank you all. Um, any questions, please email us, and we are more than happy to be able to you know, get back to you and, and share whatever information that we can. Um, so thank you, and I, um, again, I really do. I look forward to your submissions. It's wonderful seeing all of the, the different grants that come in, you know, the applications that come in, and the various needs that are out there. We learn so much about um, our community and, you know, what's needed on the ground. So thank you so very much, and um, have a, a really wonderful day. Thank you. This concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.